All right, so if you have a Bible, Mark chapter 5, that's where we're going to be uh, today. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 20. So as we get ready to do that, let me pray. God, we're so grateful uh, this morning to be here. I thank you for these men and their wives that we just um, uh, heard that we heard their stories and they've been working through a process and I thank you for the leadership of this church. God, I'm thankful to be here and I'm thankful to be under their uh, loving and wise and biblical authority and um, pray that you would move this process forward and you continue to shape uh, this church as you so desire. And we know that you um, are God who has given us our freedom in Christ and I just want to take the time, Lord, to remember um, on this Memorial Day weekend, um, men and women who have given their lives um, for this country and, and for the protections of our freedom. And so, Lord, we think of the families who have lost loved ones, and we pray for them in your peace, God, and that you would draw them near to yourself. And uh, we thank you for uh, the land that we live in. We pray for this country, God, that you, would, um, that you would govern our hearts and that we would be your light in this place so that people in our nation can know you. And uh, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who gave his life for our ultimate freedom. And uh, so we come to you in freedom, thanking you for the cleansing of our sins, thanking you that we can come before you. And uh, God, would you open our hearts now as we open your word? Would you help us to see the mercy of Jesus and to spread that message of mercy for his glory and for the good of people who need this mercy? We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So I have this habit that my wife considers a bad habit. I don't know that I consider a bad habit, but she does. So often when people come over to our house, what ends up happening, I don't know if you experience this in, in your household, if you have groups of people over, but somehow it's like junior high has not left us. It just kind of takes, it just shifts forms because the women sort of end up talking in a circle and then the guys do as well. And so what I do is I, I just have this habit of grabbing my iPad and sharing with them funny videos that I've come across. And it always happens that way. Where we're huddled over and we're laughing and the women are having these meaningful conversations. So sometimes before people come over to our house, my wife says to me, could you please try to have some meaningful conversations with the guys? And I'm like, honey, I'm a pastor. I do that all day. It's YouTube time. So um, I just feel compelled to share things that I find funny. Now, other people feel compelled to share other things, like maybe pictures of their food on social media. I mean, this is kind of a normal thing. Um, for example, a friend of mine recently shared a picture on Facebook of the dinner that he had with his wife. Um, I've, I wanted to show this picture, share it with you since he shared it. I've concealed their identities because I didn't ask them for permission, but this is the picture that, <laughs> that, they, that they shared, you know. So, my buddy whose name rhymes with Karen and his wife obviously loves sushi, and as a result, you just feel compelled to, to share that with the world. Naturally, you're going to share that picture, right? Okay, you can put that away before I get in trouble. So, um, the truth is, is that we share about the things we care about. I'm going to say it again. The truth is, we share about the things that we, that we care about. Um, if something's important to us, if something's impacted, impacted us in some way, we naturally share that, don't we? I mean, um, think about like maybe an epic movie that you saw. You're like, you tell the person about this movie. I saw this amazing movie. Maybe you read a book that was very influential in your life. And so you're like, oh my gosh, I read this book. You should read this book. This book changed my life. Or maybe you share the story of a, t uh, of a key turning point in your life. And, and, and so the things that are important to us, the things that impact us, we naturally share these things. We don't have to, um, nobody has to compel us to share them because if it's important to us, we want other people to know. It could be something trivial, like a, maybe uh, some sale, that, some sidewalk sale that you discovered, all the way to this is an event that completely like, changed my life, right? We share about the things that we care about. And the same is true when it comes to our experience with Jesus. If he's important to us, if he's impacted us in significant ways, then we're going to share that with others. And, and what we're going to see here today in Mark chapter 5 is the impact that Jesus' mercy has on a man's life. And how that mercy that, that, that this man experiences at the, at the compassionate, merciful hands of Jesus, how that leads him to share that with others because it was something that was important to him. It was something that Jesus had done in his life that it impacted him and and he shares that with others. And as we walk through this, hopefully we're going to be motivated to do the same. Because after all, uh, for those of us who, who know Jesus, um, uh, hasn't he been merciful to us? Right? So hopefully we'll be motivated and compelled to, to see the mercy and, and to share that. Now, if you're here today, I don't know everyone in this room. 
If you wouldn't call yourself a, a follower of Jesus, then I'm glad that you're here. We're glad that you're here. And I would ask you just to listen to this story. Just consider Jesus. Consider the mercy shown here and consider that he has mercy for you that you would just wrestle with the things that, that you're hearing today. So that's, that would be our invitation to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story in chunks. I'm going to point some things out, and then we're going to spend time thinking about um, Jesus' words toward the end of the story. So let me begin reading in, in Mark 5, verse 1, down through verse 13. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, that's Jesus and his disciples, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat... Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar... He ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. That is a crazy story. I mean, that's probably one of the craziest stories in in the Bible. And here's here's the interesting thing is, Following Jesus can lead you into some really crazy, uncomfortable situations. I mean, sometimes you you can you you see the 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 posters with the serene waterfall and things like this, peace, and you know, we are promised these things, but you never see like posters with a picture of a you know bloody demoniac man screaming at you and saying and Jesus saying, Follow me. Right? It's like who wants to sign up for that? These guys had just come from a storm on the lake that almost killed them, and they're freaking out. And Jesus, in his great power, he miraculously stills the, uh, the storm and saves their lives. Now they get off this boat, and they see this wild-eyed, naked, bloody, howling, demonized man running at them. If I'm a disciple, I have one thought. Get back to the boat. That's what I'm thinking. Right? Um, sometimes following Jesus can lead you into scary places. And here's what I love about Jesus. He's absolutely calm. He has absolutely no fear. He's in complete control of everything, natural and supernatural. Here's this tormented man who's whose life is being destroyed by demons. These are evil spirits who are who are part of Satan's uh, um, armies who are opposed to God opposed to people, want to destroy life. And this man has been so tormented. We don't know how he got to this place in life, but he's so tormented. His life is being destroyed. They've driven him into isolation among the burial tombs, in the caves, far away from family, far away from relationships, far away from community. He's out of his mind. He cuts himself with stones and and bleeds. I imagine he's got bloody scabs all over his body. He breaks shackles and chains by demonic power. No one can subdue him. Everyone's freaked out of their mind to be around him. And yet, here he falls prostrate before Jesus. Is Jesus afraid? He's not afraid. That's what I love, because I'm back in the boat at this point. And Jesus is there, and he waits for the man to come up to him. There are potentially thousands of demons inside this man. He asks him, what is your name? And, and, and the demons reply, legion. Okay, we know a Roman legion was roughly about 600 foot soldiers, or 6,000, excuse me, 6,000 foot soldiers and 700 cavalrymen. And here they, they sense fear. Right? It's Jesus against potentially thousands of demons. And they sense danger. Why? Because they know, and they call him the Son of the Most High God, they know that in the presence of Jesus, the presence of God's powerful rule is right there, overturning Satan's evil. And all the destruction that Satan wants to wreak. 
It's like to be in the presence of Jesus is to be in the presence of God. To be in the presence of Jesus is to be in the presence of the king of the kingdom of God that is coming that has now broken into the world with his presence. And they understand that. And so the demons beg Jesus not to send them away into judgment. And with absolute authority, you realize he gives them permission. They don't do anything apart from what Jesus allows them to do. They ask for permission. Jesus against thousands of demons. They ask for permission. And with complete calm and with complete authority, he gives them permission to enter into a herd of pigs. They enter into 2,000 pigs that rush down the hillside and and they get drowned um, in the sea below. I mean, imagine 2,000 pigs just floating in the water below. The the scene is incredible. And naturally, the herdsmen are freaked out of their minds. And they they split and and they run out of there. They're terrified by the whole episode. Now, let's pick it up in verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. No one could help this guy. No one could help this guy. His life is completely dominated, overrun by a demonic power. But that power of Satan and demons is nothing compared to to the power of Jesus to transform a life. And the people notice that there is a massive transformation, see, because when they come back and people are hearing about this crazy episode and they come back, they see the transformation in this man's life because now, before he was naked, now he's clothed. Before he was out of his mind, now he's sitting there in his right mind and he's, before he was like uncontrollable and now he's sitting down clothed in his right mind sitting before Jesus in the position of a disciple. He's at his feet. He's he's a disciple now. And what's amazing is they miss an incredible opportunity to be with Jesus. They're afraid of his power, it seems. They're afraid of his power. And and maybe they even prioritize more. They're more freaked out about the economic loss of the pigs. And so they misunderstand Jesus and they miss an opportunity because they beg him to leave. Now, Jesus doesn't force anyone to listen to him. So he turns and he begins to to get into the boat. But the healed man does exactly the opposite. You see, they begged him, there's a word, they begged him to leave. And instead, this man doing the exact opposite, it says he begged Jesus. He He begged Jesus that he might, what? Be with him. He wants to be with him. You see, that's the right response. If you really, in your life, experience the compassion of Jesus. If in your life you experience the power of Jesus, you want to be with him. See, it's not just I'm going to use Jesus to get what I want and heal me and fix my life. It's not, it's not just that. It's I want to be with you. Aren't you drawn to people who do kind things for you? And this man has seen amazing kindness and power at the hands of Jesus, and he wants to be with him. But what's interesting is Jesus doesn't let him, even though this man is begging. Instead, he commands the man this, in verse 19. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So this is where we want to slow down. What we want to do here is I just want to highlight four words here from Jesus' statement to the man, from what he tells him. Four words um, that are important if we want to think about us sharing Jesus. We consider his impact on our life, his mercy in our life, and and sharing that with other people. We want to think about these words. So the first word is this. The first word is go. It's go. Jesus says to the man, you can't come with me. There's something important I need you to do. And he says, you need to go. It's a command. Why? Because people need to hear about Jesus. Wait a second, though. How long has this man been a disciple of Jesus? Like 45 minutes, right? And Jesus says, you're a missionary now. This man does not have to first go through an evangelism training class, 
although those can be helpful, they're apparently not necessary prerequisites to going. Okay? Uh, he doesn't get to say, whoa, whoa, hold up, Jesus. I don't know the Bible that well. I'm not good with this stuff. What if people ask me questions that I don't know the answers to? I thought pastors were supposed to do this kind of stuff. He doesn't get to say that. Uh, he doesn't have the, the, the option of incubating in a small group for five years before he feels mature enough to share his faith in Jesus with others. It's like fling open the doors, you're going. You're going. Jesus simply commands him and all his followers to go because the work of Jesus in your life deserves to be shared. The work of Jesus in your life deserves to be shared regardless of how long you've been a follower of Jesus, regardless of how much or how little you know. There, Jesus has an urgency about going. Do we have that same urgency? Here's the second word. The second word is home. Jesus says, go home to your friends or, or literally to your own, to your people, to your friends, your family, your, your own people. We don't know how long he had been apart from them. I mean, it could have been, it could have been a year. It could have been 10 years. But Jesus says, go to the people, go home to the people that you know, um, back into those relationships. It's not a foreign mission field. Now, God calls some people to go to foreign mission fields. This is not calling the man to go to a foreign mission field. He's saying, go home to your own people, to your own place. It's your town. It's the place where people already know him, the man. And these are people who don't know Jesus. And there are people in our lives who don't know Jesus. There are family members. There are friends. They're your, they're your co-workers. They're your classmates. They're the people you interact with daily. They need to hear about Jesus. And so Jesus says to us, he says, go, and he says, go to these people, the people you already know, the people that are already in your circles. Um, they don't know me, and they need to know me. And, and, and what better people to share Jesus with them than us, right, who, who already know them? I realize there's sometimes some difficulties in sharing Christ and sharing our faith with the people that are close to us because there's more to lose, right, than, than, than maybe sharing with a stranger. But I'm just looking at this, and Jesus is saying, go to, go to the people you already know. Go, to, go tell your friends, go tell your family. Um, this is very interesting. Did you know that a survey, not done, it wasn't done too long ago, found that 75 to 90% of new believers come to Christ through a friend or an acquaintance who explains the gospel to them one-on-one. So this is not to discount outreach events, this is not to discount this Sunday morning experience, but I'm just going with the, the study here that says, 75 to 90% of people who come to Christ do so through one-on-one -on -one explaining. Do not discount the power of your influence, of your story, of you sharing the gospel in the lives of the people that you already know. Um, don't disregard the effectiveness of that. Jesus obviously thinks that there's something to it. He believes it's important because he tells this guy to do it. Here's a third word, tell. Jesus commands the man to tell people what Jesus had done for him. This means that we actually have to open our mouths. We actually have to open our mouths. I understand there's a phrase that's been used in the church for some time, lifestyle evangelism. Now, yes, of course our lifestyle should reflect that we follow Jesus. It doesn't help to share Christ with your coworker um, while you're taking cash out of, the, out, of the, out of the register and putting it in your pocket, right? Um, your lifestyle should, should match what you are professing with your words, but... But here's the deal, is that your coworker or your neighbor or your family member cannot learn how to receive God's mercy and be in right relationship with God um, by observing that you're a good person. Salvation does not come by observation. You see that? No one can just look into your life and see that they might think you're just a fantastic person. Wow, he's really generous. He's so honest. Awesome things. We should be those things but they can't see Jesus and know that he died on the cross and rose from the dead to save them unless we tell them. And Jesus says, go. Um, now the cross obviously hadn't happened yet, so he couldn't tell them about the cross, but for what you do know, what Jesus has done and said to you, you share these things. And now we're on the other side of the cross and we have the whole story, right? So this is what Romans 10, 17 says. It says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the, what? The, the word of Christ. Not the lifestyle of Christ, that's important, created to live like him, to be like him. But people come to faith through hearing the word of Christ. They need to hear the word so that they can respond in faith. So we have to open our mouths. 
We have to tell people about Jesus. That's the only way for people to meet him and respond to him. So the question becomes, what specifically should we tell them? What should we tell them about Jesus? The answer, I mean, I'm not looking for, we're not looking for like a canned sort of cookie cutter, only say these words here. We're not saying that. But, but listen, the answer in terms of what we should tell people can be summed up in this fourth word that Jesus says, which is mercy. Mercy. Jesus wants the man to tell his own people something specific. He says, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. To have mercy means to be greatly concerned about somebody and to show them compassion. To be greatly concerned about someone in need and to show them compassion. If you are a follower of Jesus, he has shown you mercy. Manifold mercy. Mercy upon mercy. All kinds of mercy he has shown to you. He's done things in your life and he wants you to share that. Your relationship with Jesus is supposed to be personal but never private. You see, he's done things in your life and that is personal to you. But it's not supposed to be private. And in our culture today, as it comes to religion and faith, oh, that's, that's personal and that's private. But the two are not the same. You see what I'm saying? Like something can be very important and very personal to you and our culture is saying, you keep that to yourself. You don't say anything. But Jesus is saying, this personal thing that I have done for you, I want you to go share that. So our faith is never supposed to be private, even though it is personal to us. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have told the man to go tell people, right? So the question is, what has the Lord done for you? Think about what has the Lord done for you personally in your life? How has he shown you mercy? Did he provide for you financially in the 11th hour when that bill was due or the mortgage payment was due and somehow some reimbursement check you didn't even know about came in the mail and was like for exactly the right amount that you need? I've heard a number of stories like that. It's like amazing. It's as if God wants to say, see, I'm taking care of you. And you should tell somebody about that. Or, or did Jesus save your marriage? Maybe your marriage was crumbling. Maybe there was even infidelity and God has healed and restored and, and, and put your marriage together. You know what? There are marriages falling apart everywhere. And if God restored your marriage, you have a story. You have a testimony. People will listen to that. You don't think people will listen to that if their marriage is falling apart and, and they, they know it needs to be healed and, and you come in and you share about Jesus and what he did in your marriage? Oh, people will listen to you. They'll listen to you. Or maybe, maybe there was no reconciliation. Maybe your spouse abandoned you or maybe a parent abandoned you. Maybe a loved one abandoned you and, and, and yet Jesus came in and he mended your broken heart and he comforted you in the aftermath of it all. And you, yes, there's pain there. Yes, there's scarring. Yes, there are hard memories. But Jesus has been good to you in the aftermath of all of that. Tell someone. Or maybe... Uh, before you started following Jesus, you made tons of money and that's what you were living for and finally your career got built up and you made so much money and all the promotions and finally you reach this point where you're standing on a pile of cash, a mountain of cash. You're at the peak and you're like, my heart and my soul is still empty. And then Jesus came in and he filled your soul and he gave you life and you realized that's where life is. You know, there's a lot of people that are, are climbing up the mountain wanting to stand on a pile of cash and maybe if you've been there and you know that doesn't fill you and Jesus has come in and filled your soul, then you tell them. Tell them about what God has done through Christ. Or maybe substance abuse or maybe some habitual sin dominated your life for a time. But Jesus came in and he forgave you for that as you repented and he freed you from that and you're walking in freedom with a clean conscience which is a gift from God. Tell somebody. There's people who are under the burden of just habitual sin and things they cannot control in their lives and they need to hear about Jesus. All of this, all of this is mercy. So tell someone, tell someone. And you might say, but it's awkward to fumble through telling people about Jesus. Yeah, sometimes it is. Or you might say, it's awkward, really, to share all my personal stuff with people. Like, that's really personal, and so it's, it's hard for me. It's really awkward. Yeah, maybe, but if this man can share his story, so can you. Because I'm pretty sure it doesn't get any more awkward than telling people you used to run around naked in graveyards. Just a thought. Just a thought for you, okay? Do we realize that there are so many people who've never heard or understood about the mercy of God? Down in the South, it's, like, it's kind of like Bible Belt, and everyone is 
apparently a Christian. I, I don't think that everyone there is born again or really has a relationship with Jesus. But, but culturally there, it's sort of like Christianity is kind of known. And up here, it's amazing how many people I run into, and, and they don't, yeah, they maybe have heard of Jesus. Um, maybe they've heard of God. But you know what I'm finding, just being a father of, of little girls, is that my kids' classmates have no idea. I mean, we live in such a place, such a secular place that people, you know, um, some weeks ago, well, actually, it was just last week, I was praying, um, Lindsay and I were praying with our girls, as, as we do before we go to bed, and I was just praying, God, would you give us, one of the things I was praying, God, would you give us an opportunity um, as a family, meaning parents, but also kids, to share Jesus with those who don't, who don't know you, and I, and I prayed specifically for our neighbors, and, and one uh, family in particular in our cul-de-sac, and then after I said amen, my middle daughter, Noelle, goes, Daddy, I already did that. And I'm like, well, what do, you, what do you mean you did that? And she goes, well, we were playing, I was playing with my friend um, in the cul-de-sac, one of her classmates, and Mommy called us to get in the van because we were going to church. So I said, bye, and I said, she goes, where are you going? I said, I have to go to church. And she goes, what's that? And then she goes, oh, that's where, that's where you go to, to learn about God and Jesus. And then the girl goes, who's that? She's never heard about God. She's never even heard God. She's never even heard the name Jesus. And so Noel goes, you know, church is a place where you learn about God and Jesus. And she goes, who's that? And then Noel goes, my seven-year-old goes, well, God is the creator of everything, and Jesus is our Savior. And I'm thinking, people need to know. There, another one of my daughter's classmates, um, somebody mentioned God, and she goes, what's that? I mean, people don't even know about Jesus. That's only increasing. Who better to tell them about the mercy of Jesus than the ones who have received and experienced his mercy? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have experienced his mercy, not only for everyday life, the things I was kind of giving you examples of, but for eternal life. This is what Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, but God being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It is the mercy of God that took your lifeless heart and breathed life into it. That's why you are alive today in Jesus. Because he had mercy on you. Because he is rich in mercy. This is God's story of mercy, and we can use our individual stories of mercy of how God has been good to us and connect it to that story. You see, because what our testimonies, our individual stories do is they put flesh and bone to help people see on these stories that Jesus is, is real, that he's powerful and good. But here's the deal. On our own, on their own, these stories don't have the power to save people. They still need to hear about the cross and the resurrection. But we take those stories of individual mercy for everyday life and we connect it to the overall God gospel story for eternal life because that's the story that saves. That Jesus lived a perfect life, that he died in our place for our sins and that three days later God rose him, raised him from the dead, all of this to bring us back to God. This doesn't mean that in every single conversation that you have with someone that you have to give this like fully articulated gospel presentation, but what it, what it does mean is that we take opportunities to share God's story. So think about how much the Lord has done for you and use that as a bridge to tell people God's mercy story through Jesus. Now we look at this story, you know, kind of when I first come to this you know, story, the, the demoniac, I'm like, how does this story connect to my life? Like this guy, I mean, I might have some stuff in my life, but this guy's like way over the edge. Like I can't relate to this guy at, at all. Last time I ran around naked like that, I was three, I think. Um, but here's the deal, is we have a lot in common. We are fundamentally the same as this man, this demonized man. We've experienced the same kind of mercy. The Bible says we were living in Satan's realm. We were living under uh, the dominion of sin, we were in darkness, but God rescued us. Listen to Colossians 1, 13 and 14. says, He, that is God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We're just like the man, rescued from the dominion of sin, rescued from darkness, rescued from Satan's realm, brought into the kingdom of God's beloved 
son. We've experienced the same kind of mercy. And what was this man's response to the mercy? What was his response? Look at what verse 20 says. And he went away and began to proclaim. That's the word preach. It's the word herald. It's the word declare in the Decapolis. This is the, it's like 10 cities. I'm just walking around and I'm declaring what Jesus has done for me. How much Jesus had done for him, it says. Immediately, he begins, he obeys Jesus and he begins to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him because the, the mercy of Jesus is still fresh on his tongue. It just happened. And how many of us, I wonder, who have been following Christ for a time, were you zealous? Did you tell people about the mercy of Jesus after he saved you, when you experienced it? And yet, it's so easy for us as the years go on to sort of, somehow the taste of God's mercy isn't as strong on our tongues anymore. See, this man, he had the mercy on his tongue, and then he begins immediately to use hit that tongue to proclaim that mercy. We need to go back, and we need to think about the mercy that's been shown to us to, to reacclimate our taste buds for the mercy of God so that we use these tongues to proclaim the mercy that's been given to us. It's still fresh on his tongue. Would it be fresh on our tongue? Oh, God, give us that, that sense of, yes, you have been good to me. Because when we sense that, when we're convicted by that, we won't keep it to ourselves. He couldn't keep it to himself, to himself. How could he? And neither can we if we really taste the mercy and we understand it. And the last part of verse 20 says, and everyone marveled. Now, they were amazed. Now, it doesn't say that everyone immediately began to, to follow Jesus, but that's not our job, is it? But what it shows you is that people will listen, leave them following to Jesus between them and God, you tell of his mercy. And maybe people also will marvel. And by God's grace, people will come and begin to follow him. Our job is simply to obey Jesus and tell others about him. Say you were starving and you discovered an unlimited supply of food such that you ate your fill and you were satisfied. Now this is an unlimited supply of food. Would you not then go and tell other starving people where the food is? Of course you would. Well, the, the reality is that people need God's mercy like starving people need food. People need God's mercy like starving people need God's food. How will they hear of the mercy of Christ if not from the very ones who have experienced his mercy? So go home to your people and tell them of the mercy of Jesus. Go and tell someone what God has done in your life and tell someone about the mercy of of Jesus for eternal life. And by God's grace, people will hear and people will respond like this man. God's still in the business of saving people, but he's also in the business of using us to proclaim and to tell. And if you're here today and you've never received the mercy of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for new and eternal life with him, then today's the day. Then you tell him, I want this mercy. Forgive me my sins. I want this new life. And he will give it to you. And then tell someone. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this, this word. We thank you for this story. And um, we're grateful that you love us enough to teach us about the mercy of Jesus, to draw us to you, to impact our lives. And we would pray, God, that the mercy would be fresh on our tongues, that we would listen to the story, this story, and that we would remember what you've done in our lives and that you would refresh in the taste on our tongues of your mercy so that we would take these same tongues and we would proclaim that mercy into the lives of others. Lord, give us a fresh sense. Remind us of who you are and what you've done. Thank you that you have saved us, those who are following Christ, from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. And Lord, if there are those here who have never received this mercy, God, would you just help them to understand and know right now that you have mercy and new life for them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.